next will be Prof. Assistant Professor Baha Bora. She will present the hemodynamic assessment. Thank you very much to all the organizers. Um, I am truly honored and privileged to be here and sharing um, knowledge with you all. I will be talking about hemodynamic assessment in the DNA. This is a huge, huge topic. We have a lot of things that are being used. We have a lot of things that are being talked about. We have a lot of parameters that are used in research. So I'll try to talk briefly about a lot of these things. I have no conflicts of interest to disclose. We'll start with something very, very basic. The reason why we're here today is because we're trying to determine if our patient is in shock. So shock is a pathophysiologic state characterized by an imbalance between oxygen demand and oxygen delivery, leading to tissue hypoxia. This is hemodynamics 101. Now shock can show up either in the compensated phase or uncompensated phase. What would be fortunate if, is if we would diagnose this in the compensated phase. But unfortunately, because of the hemodynamic assessment tools that we have in current practice, more often than not, we tend to pick it up in the uncompensated phase, at which point it's already delayed and we've already had some effects that might be permanent. Add to this some of the unique challenges that we see with a premature infant in the transitional period and beyond. Some of these might be the relative adrenal insufficiency, immature myocardium, the transition from low vascular resistance with the removal of the placenta to the higher vascular resistance at birth. These things make our population unique, and hence the hemodynamic tools that might be used in the pediatric population or in the adult population cannot be extrapolated to the neonatal population. Beyond the transitional period, there might be presence of shunts, such as a patent ductus arteriosus, a PFO, an ASD, and these, again, will not let the usual tools of assessment that may be used elsewhere uh, apply to the DNAC. A little bit more of the basics. What does the cardiovascular status in the body really, really depend on? The blood pressure, which we'll talk about in a little bit of detail, is determined by cardiac output and your systemic vascular resistance. Your cardiac output, in turn, is determined by your heart rate and your stroke volume, which can be determined by the preload, afterload, contractility, and an interaction between all these three. The systemic vascular resistance, in turn, depends on the neuroendocrine and the paracrine regulatory mechanisms. So our tools of assessment that I'll be talking about today will depend on all of these things. We'll be talking about each of these measures separately. I like to simplify things in big bold letters, so this is what we're going to do. Blood pressure depends on your cardiac output and your systemic vascular resistance. Now in this equation, there are three fundamental factors. And we need to remember that cardiac output and the systemic vascular resistance are the independent variables that are regulated by the body. The blood pressure is the dependent variable because it is the product of interaction between these two independent variables. And yet, what we end up measuring most of the time is this variable, the blood pressure. Now, aside from the pathophys about shock, since we're gonna be talking about tools of hemodynamic assessment, what would we want these tools to do? What would be the characteristics for these tools be? They should be in real time, they should be continuous, non-invasive, they should be practical, something that everybody can easily apply in the units, inexpensive, they should be reliable, repeatable, precise. Their value should be validated with something that is considered gold standard. There should be normative values established. And these should be accurate along the entire spectrum of gestational age. So please keep these in mind when I'm talking about all the parameters today. Most of the tools that I talk about will not qualify for an ideal tool. So we're still looking for that ideal tool for monitoring. What do we most commonly use in the NICU? We do get fixated on a couple things. One is heart rate, one is blood pressure. So is heart rate really helpful to us? 
In the adults, it is used as um, an indicator of your preload status. And heart rate does have an intricate relationship with ultimately your cardiac output. However, the utility in neonates is affected by many different factors, such as autonomic instability and immature myocardium in the premature infants. So heart rate by itself may not be that great of a tool. But how about application of heart rate? We can look at heart rate variability. Heart rate variability measures have been used to identify septic patients in emergency room settings with impending septic shock. We've even had papers describing normal numbers in healthy newborn infants. There was a systematic review consisting of four studies showed that heart rate variability metrics may be a promising bedside tool for early prediction of brain injury and neurodevelopmental outcome in babies with neonatal encephalopathy. And the numbers they showed were pretty significant, but this still needs to be applied in conditions of shock in the NICU. Another application might be either the pulse pressure or the stroke hold volume variation. Dynamic indices based on preload changes secondary to cardiopulmonary interaction during positive pressure ventilation have been used to predict fluid responsiveness in adults. According to the Frank Starling relation, these ventilator induced preload changes can result in variation in the stroke volume and the proposed surrogate marker of stroke volume the arterial pulse pressure. However, their use in neonates is limited because of the low heart rate to respiratory rate ratio that is observed in neonates. And this results in the presence of different fre frequencies, which impedes the analysis and the interpretation. The stroke volume variation, as I said, would be the change in the amount of blood that is ejected from the left ventricle into the aorta with each heartbeat. Again, this has been confirmed um, as having some diagnostic value in predicting fluid responsiveness in children under mechanical ventilation. But further studies are needed to confirm the diagnostic accuracy and utility of this tool in predicting fluid responsiveness in children. So at this time, it's more of a research-based tool. How about blood pressure? This is something we most commonly use, and this is what we use to diagnose hypotension, diagnose shock. So the most common definition that is used all around is a thumb rule of mean blood pressure less than gestational age. It actually has no pathophysiologic basis or evidence base. This was first introduced by the British Association of Perinatal Medicine Guidelines for the Management of Respiratory Disorders, where this is what they said. At the present time, the working group agrees that a mean arterial blood pressure equivalent to the gestational age in weeks is adequate as a minimum value. This is where this all started. Unfortunately, it has stuck around a little bit too long for the lack of better resources or better tools. So what constitutes normal pr blood pressure? A number of people have tried to answer these questions, and there are a couple data uh, points that have been used and that are more commonly followed. Um, the Zubro's numbers or um, guidelines have been followed for a while. These are derived from a prospective study that collected serial blood pressure measurements from both preterm and term infants admitted to several NICUs. Um, this was a cumulative data of 1 to 99 days of flight in about 600 infants admitted to 14 NICUs in the United States. A similar group um, worked um, in UK by the name of Northern Neonatal Nursing Initiative and they have based um, these numbers on a study of 389 preterm infants. So these two are some of the more commonly used parameters for what normal blood pressures might be. But the question is, is blood pressure a reliable measure? In a group of 126 infants studied at five hours of age, using Doppler echo and cerebral ultrasound, there was a comparison that was done between mean blood pressure and SBC flows, the superior benefit of flows. And what they found, that blood pressure and SBC flows were discordant 42% of the times. So there's a very weak relationship between blood pressure and blood flow, particularly in the first 24 hours of life when the brain is most vulnerable. Why do we care so much about blood pressures? The reason is, there have been studies that show that a low SBC flow may be related to a higher incidence 
of worse grades of IVH. And there might be um, some correlation between these two measures. But what about the cerebral blood flow? That is what we care about the most at the end of the day. This was a study that was done in 12 infants um, that became, uh, on 17 extremely low birth weight infants that became um, hypotensive, 12 of them, and were treated with dopamine. What was found, that the cerebral blood flow of normal tensive infants was maintained at 19, but the cerebral blood flow of hypotensive infants dropped to 14. What does that mean? The cerebral autoregulation is functional in normal tensive infants, but not so much in hypotensive infants. A break point exists at 30 millimeters mercury in the cerebral blood flow um, autoregulation, mean um, arterial blood pressure autoregulation curve. What this means for us is that yes, there might be autoregulation in healthy infants, there might be autoregulation in healthy normal tensive infants, but if you take a premature hypotensive infants, this can have great consequences. One more step. Let's say we consider blood pressure significant enough and we treat it. Does treating hypotension really help? This retrospective cohort study was done on live-born, extremely low birth weight infants admitted to an NICU over a four-hour, four-year period. Patients were grouped as either normal intensive, and we used our commonly used definition of blood pressure, never less than gestational age. Hypotensive and not treated, these were the infants who did have a low blood pressure than gestational age, but with signs of good perfusion, this is permissive hypotension. And the third group being hypotensive treated infants. 118 patients were identified and 108 patients were known to have hypotension. What they found was that the normal tensive patients and the patients designated as permissive hypotension had similar outcomes. What was worse though was that in a logistic regression model, treated hypotension was independently associated with mortality with odds ratio of eight. This is very, very significant. Do we care about the harms of low blood pressure, or do we care about the harms of the treatment that we get to fix this low blood pressure? So perhaps blood pressure may not be the primary target. Rather, we should be looking at the etiology behind the perceived inadequate blood pressure. Perhaps more important might be the concept of adequate blood flow. There are measures of systemic blood, uh, measures of systemic blood flow and peripheral organ perfusion. So let's talk about systemic blood flow assessment. The most commonly used parameters in mature circulation are either the left or the right ventricular outputs. How are these measured? There can be invasive methods, such as thermal dilution, which I will not be talking about. Um, the newer methods that may be used are the magnetic resonance imaging, electric velocimetry, or transthoracic echocardiography. Functional cardiac MRI has been shown to be a feasible tool to evaluate cardiac hemodynamics, especially the PDA. Gestation-related reference values for cardiac filling, cardiac output, and systemic perfusion have been described. What this study showed was that the, the quantitative measures appear to be more repeatable than echocardiographic assessments. So this might be a means to providing insights into the pathophysiology of circulatory failure. But is this, that can be, is this something that can be applied to our daily use in the NICU? Probably not for many more years. Impedance electrical cardiometry allows for assessment of cardiac output by measuring the changes in the thoracic electrical bioimpedance caused by the cardiac cycle. It is non-invasive, it's easy to apply, it offers continuous assessment, so it has a lot of promises. In addition, positive correlation of cardiac output measured by electric cardiometry with gestational age, body surface area, and weight has been established. In a study of 115 paired measurements of left ventricular output by electrical velocimetry versus echocardiography in 20 infants showed that the true precision measured by EV was similar to the precision of echocardiography. So this is something that is definitely opening up the doors to some more better assessment tools. How about, how about measurement through echocardiography? The left ventricular and right ventricular outputs 
are a couple of very simple measurements that can be obtained. The measurements that you need would be an aortic diameter and a pulse wave Doppler in case of an LV output. The calculations are pretty simple and normal numbers have been established. And similar is the case for the right ventricular output. The problem with the left ventricular and the right ventricular output measurements in newborns is that LVO, the, the assumption that LVO corresponds with a systemic blood flow cannot be held true in premature infants or newborns because of the presence of shunts. In the presence of PDA with the left to right shunt, the systemic blood flow is overestimated by left ventricular output, while in the presence of a right to left shunt, it is underestimated. Similarly, the right ventricular output is affected by the presence of the shunts at the level of the foramen valve. So perhaps a better indicator of systemic blood flow might be something that does not get affected by the atrial shunts, and that something might be superior ventricular flow. SVC flow, what is it? It's the blood from the upper body, head, neck, arms, and also a little bit from the lower body. The problem, again, is the contribution of brain blood flow to SVC in the preterm infant is not completely known. But it is a simple measure. It can be obtained by functional echocardiography, and it does offer the benefit of uh, bypassing the interference by the presence of shunts. Studies have been done to look, looking at those SVC flows. Um, it has actually been shown that around a third of the babies born before 30 weeks might have low SVC flows within the first 24 hours of life and usually a number less than 30 to 45 mLs per kilo per minute is considered low in the first postnatal day. This is the data that we, we had seen earlier um, comparing infants who had low SVC flows and correlating it with IVH. What they did find was that late IVH is strongly associated with these low flow states and occurs as perfusion improves. An issue here is that there might be too many studies and there might be conflicting studies. This study shows that their uh, early low SVC flow was associated with substantial rate of death, morbidity, and developmental impairments. However, this study said that SVC flows were insensitive in predicting IVH. So there is still, still a lot that needs to be learned. We've also talked about this. Is there a correlation between our favorite measure um, tool of tool of measurement in an ICU, the mean blood pressure and SVC flow. And we found, we've already talked about this, they were discordant 42% of the times. So in addition to the systemic blood flow, can we also measure something else? We can look at the organ blood flow um, assessment using Doppler velocimetry. This unfortunately is not a continuous measurement, it's only snapshots and it cannot detect the heterogeneous areas of low oxygenation within the organ system. But the various organ systems that can be targeted are the cerebral blood flow, intestinal blood flow, and the renal blood flow with the MCA and the ACA arteries, SMA and celiac, and the renal artery flows respectively. Again, they may not be very helpful as one specific number, but they may be helpful in tracking or in trending. Another thing that I have found useful, I, do, I may not use the actual numbers, the resistive indices or the peak velocities, but I may look at the reversal of flow to use that as an indicator of decreased perfusion. What about the actual tissue oxygen delivery? Whatever the blood's pumping out, is it getting to the tissues or not? There are a lot of conventional measures that we already use. There's a urine output, acidosis, capillary refill time. There are some studies that show the benefit, but then there are some studies that show that the sensitivity and the specificity may not be that high. Urine output of less than one and a half ml per kilo per hour is associated with high mortality in neonates as shown by one of these studies. A metabolic acidosis and serum level of more than two and a half might also be indicative of some trauma. Capillary refill time might be helpful, but again, it's affected by a lot of confounding factors as ambient temperature, inter-observer variability, medications, and autonomic maturity. They may not be helpful just by themselves, but if you put these things together, that might be of a higher value. This study showed that if you combine a capillary refill time of more than four seconds with a serum lactate of more than four millimoles per liter, then the sensitivity 
for such a test in predicting low flow states would be 50%, specificity would be 97, a positive predictive value of 80%, and a negative predictive value of 88%. So there might be some use. In addition, there are other measures such as mixed venous oxygenation. This, unfortunately, there's no linear relationship that has been shown between SCVO2 and the cardiac output in children. And yet, it has been shown that early goal-directed therapy using intermittent SCVO2 monitoring systems may reduce mortality rates and improve organ dysfunction in pediatric patients with septic shock. This and central venous pressure, even though it's a poor indicator of preload, have been used in the pediatric critical care guidelines in management of shock. So these are some of the limitations of the last few um, indicators we used. Urine output, lactate, um, metabolic acidosis, decreased urinary output. Unfortunately, these are not specific to shock. So are there any novel measures at looking um, at tissue oxygen delivery? Perfusion index is one of uh, the newer indices. It is a ratio of the pulsatile and non-pulsatile components using the plethysmographic signal of pulse oximeter. It's reasonably predictive of low flow states, including a PDA. It's important because it offers non-invasive and continuous measurement. Another tool is visible light spectroscopy. This also offers continuous assessment of capillary oxygen, saturation, and various organs. The probes are really tiny, and hence they can enable oxygen oximetry measurements in very small tissues. The benefit of VLS is that unlike pulse oximetry, it's not affected by conditions of local ischemia, lack of pulsatile flow, vasoconstriction, or hypothermia. And we were able to show the, the feasibility um, of this tool in, extreme, in um, term infants um, born in our NICU. One of the more promising tools, though, is near infrared spectroscopy. NEARS can be used as a surrogate marker, marker of organ blood flow. It offers continuous, non-invasive, in vivo, real-time monitoring of regional oxygen saturation. The applications can be cerebral, renal, mesenteric, and peripheral tissue oxygenation. It can also be used to measure the oxygen demand and delivery coupling, so blood flow and oxygen extraction. <coughs> this is what a nearest monitor looks like. We commonly monitor the cerebral and the renal numbers, and the probes um, are something that have a very um, small surface area. Some of the common applications in the NICU that we currently use, we use this as a monitoring tool in congenital heart diseases. This can sometimes be used to, to monitor the transition after birth of preterm infant. We do use it in hypoxic ischemia against cephalopathy. Obviously, conditions of shock in patent leptus arteriosus to look at your renal perfusion and cerebral perfusion, peri-intraventricular hemorrhage, and spinal per perfusion in NEC. And yet, what needs to be uh, remembered is that validation for this is still lacking. Accuracy and precision are still questionable, and pro bias is considerable. There are different methods, there are different algorithms, and different data requirements. And some assumptions have to be made when you're using NEARS, such as stable hemoglobin concentration, venous arterial blood ratios, and cerebral metabolic oxygen demands. So this is still a tool that is talked about um, in research uh, purposes, but this is also one of the most commonly newer um, used tools in the NIC. There are, this study showed, um, when comparing the cerebral oxygenation with the superior vena cava flow, that both uh, decreased cerebral oxygen saturation as measured by NEARS and low SVC flows were associated with increased risk of death. This is a study that was put out by um, uh, Valerie Chalk, and it, they use a number of renal NEARS of 66% as one of the additional indicators for hemodynamic significance of PDA, and this is something that is used in the unit every single day. Another tool is amplitude integrated EEG, AEG. This is for functional assessment of brain activity, it is a simplified method of continuous brain function monitoring that displays trended brain activity. It's a single or double channel EEG recorded by three to five electrodes attached to the skull. It is being increasingly used in neonates with HIE, preceding hypothermia, and congenital heart diseases. 
and potential application of monitoring brain activity during transitional circulation and in all conditions of hemodynamic compromise. This is what the machine looks like. We use only four leads, so it doesn't require a lot of surface area. And there are ver various patterns of AEG have been described. So this is a tool that a neonatologist at the bedside can use and not rely on, um, on our neurology teams. the most important components of cardiovascular function can provide information required for the timely recognition and appropriate management. So systems that integrate conventional use technologies to continuously measure um, the, the measurements that you see on the screen, that are, they are being utilized more and more. Now, very briefly, I'll touch on the role of functional echocardiography. This sounds like a big elephant um, in the room that nobody wants to experiment with, but once you have the skills, the assessment of cardiovascular status with functional echo is pretty simple. There are multiple terms used for functional echocardiography, but this is a slide I want you guys to pay attention to. Looking at the cardiac function is simple. Looking at your pulmonary pressures is again, two or three steps. You can have a fast quantitative assessment of pulmonary hypertension, and you can have a fast quantitative assessment of your um, cardiac function. eyeballing the heart and looking at the um, volume status and contractility, looking at your IBC status for uh, preload status, looking at the size of your right ventricle on long uh, peristernal axis, looking at the morphology of your septum to determine the increased pressures, looking at the direction of the shunt at the side of PDA, ASD or PFO, the size of the right ventricle compared to the left ventricle, looking at the morphology of your P, PA uh, pulmonary artery Doppler waveforms and measuring something called the tricuspid jet velocity gives you a very simple calculation giving you pulmonary artery pressures. The right ventricular function can be easily um, measured with something called TAPSI, which even though it's a very long name, it's a very, very simple measurement. And your LV function can be determined by either the shortening fraction or ejection fractions, which are again two very simple measurements to obtain. Functional echocardiography also gives you very quick information about the size of the duct, the direction of the shunting, the LA to AO root ratio, the LPA diastolic velocity, and the pattern of diastolic flow in the postectal descending aorta. So functional echocardiography can be used to glean a lot of information that pertains to a lot of different pathologies that may be seen in the NIC. And most certainly, guidelines have been recommended to integrate the use of functional echocardiography in your everyday um, hemodynamic measurement in the NIC. So I'll leave you guys with this. If you have a hemodynamically compromised patient, when you think about the assessment tools, also think about what's the bigger picture. What you really care about is the organ perfusion. How do you measure organ perfusion and how does it really relate to the numerical hypotension? Does the low perfusion state correlate with suboptimal tissue oxygenation? And what is the etiology contributing to the low perfusion state? Is there a problem with preload, afterload, or myocardial dysfunction? Is there a significant PDA? Is there a congenital heart disease? And how can you assess all of these about? At the end of the day, it is the interaction between your systemic blood pressure, your systemic flow, and your systemic vascular resistance that matters. And what will help you is assessment of all these individually and in combination with each other. So in conclusion, we're just getting started. Thank you.
Functional echo. Uh, 